Now let me give you a little history uh, for the reason for this talk. For reasons unbeknownst to me, Nikita started asking me questions about some of this material, which is now 12 years or more old. Uh, and I think at some point he's going to tell us why he was asking me these questions. But that caused me to go back and look at this material again. Coincidentally, I was having conversations with Atiyah where some of these same ideas were coming up. So this really caused me to go back and revisit it. And uh, so I thought I would just give a talk about some of the basics of the material. It was a long and involved collaboration involving many different people. Uh, it really started when Bob Friedman and I were trying to do computations for anti-self-dual invariance of four manifolds, Donaldson theory. And in particular, we were concentrating on elliptic surfaces, uh, algebraic surfaces that are presented as families of elliptic curves. These were some interesting examples. Donaldson had shown the four-dimensional h cobordism theorem didn't hold for at least one of these manifolds. And we were trying to compute these invariants. And the way we did it was to think of the surface. It was presented as fibered by elliptic curves and study the bundles in question by restricting to each elliptic, elliptic curve and then seeing what they look like. OK, so Columbia University, in its wisdom, decided to grant Ed Witten an honorary degree and I was appointed as his uh, escort. So we're to meet in the robing room at 10 o'clock on graduation day. Uh, and at 10.30, we're going to march out. So I'm there. 10 o'clock comes, no Witten. 10.15 comes, no Witten. 10.20 comes, no Witten. 10.25 comes, in walks Ed. Conversation went like this. Ed, I'm so glad you're here. I was worried about you. You know, we have to get dressed and go. OK, do you know anything about G bundles over elliptic curves? <laughs> and then that started a collaboration that in the beginning was three-way between Bob Friedman and, and Witten and me. And then, you know, as physicists are wont to do, Witten sort of finished his part and went on and did 50 other things. And Bob and I are still exploring various byways and alleys. And we wrote several more papers by ourselves. And it eventually turned into a uh, closely related project with uh, Borel, which I won't have time to talk about here. So, and it spanned about six or eight years. And as I went back and looked, there's well over 500 pages we wrote about it. So I won't be able to tell you everything about all of that today. Uh, and as I say, there are many interesting questions that I really won't get to. Um, singular elliptic curves, families of elliptic curves, relations to these very well-known objects in uh, algebraic group theory, the constant section and the Steinberg section and Lie algebras and Lie groups of regular elements. All beautiful stuff, but I won't be able to get there. All right, so I think in my audience there are a lot of people who aren't familiar with the basics of elliptic curves. So let me just say a few words about uh, the setup, and in particular about elliptic curves. Is that me, or is that something else? Okay. Construction. They always seem to construct while this seminar is going on. So E is an elliptic curve. Um, to a first approximation, this is simply a smooth holomorphic or algebraic curve of genus 1. So uh, topologically, it's a torus. But I'm actually going to mean this in the technical sense of an elliptic curve. So there is a distinguished point on the elliptic curve, p naught, And once you've chosen this point, there's a holomorphic group law. This becomes a complex algebraic group. And this point is the origin, or 0, of the group law. And the nicest way to think about it is that these curves actually sit as cubic curves inside complex projective space, smoothly embedded. So here's one. Right? Usually, normally, you take them in Weierstrass form, but I won't talk about that right now. So there's one, or at least the real points of one. Um, there's a cubic curve, so any straight line meets it in three points. Right? And somewhere we have our p naught, which in this picture is going to be off at infinity. 
So the group law is determined by saying anytime you have three points on a line, they add up to zero. That's one piece of the group law. And the other piece of the group law is that this point that you've picked out is the identity element, which we'll call zero, of the group. So since it's now at infinity, which is off in the vertical direction, if this is z, this is minus z. And since x plus y plus z add up to 0, this is x plus y. OK, so there is a binary operation. Since two points on the elliptic curve to a third point on the elliptic curve, it's obviously a symmetric relationship. It doesn't depend on the order of x and y. And some nice algebraic geometry sort of with lines and so on will show you that this is an associative operation. And of course, it's an algebraic or holomorphic operation. That's the group law on the elliptic curve. Okay? Now, the curve I've drawn here is a curve in Weierstrass form. Turns out, in, if you move using projective coordinates, if you move this the curve around, you can always write the equation of the curve this way, where this is a cubic polynomial. Well, that's the affine part. If you write it projectively, you would write zy squared is x cubed minus, in fact, you can do it this way, g2xz squared plus g3. And the only invariants are g2 and g3 up to a <laughs> common C star action, which is degree 6 here and 4 here, 4 here and 6 here. I know, that's right. These are projective coordinates, thank you. All right, so that's what we're talking about, elliptic curves. And we mean them in this technical sense. They're all, we always have the group structure, OK? Of course, the reason, maybe I should say just not that I need it in this talk, but the reason this is called the, the Weierstrass form is that another way to present elliptic curves is the group law is a complex plane model lattice. And using the lattice, you can write down a power series, the p function associated with that lattice, and it and its derivative satisfy an equation like this. OK? OK. We're interested in, to begin with, vector bundles over the elliptic curve. And let's start with line bundles. In fact, line bundles of degree 0. Again, this is well known, probably what, 19th century algebraic geometry? They know about line bundles in the 19th century? OK. So a line bundle of degree 0, well, the first thing we need to remember is the Riemann-Roch theorem, which says that the Euler characteristic, so everything is holomorphic now. The Euler characteristic of a holomorphic line bundle over a smooth curve is given by that formula. This is the genus, which in our case is 1. So this is going to go away for us. So the Euler characteristic of a line bundle is simply the degree of the line bundle. And by definition, the Euler characteristic is the rank of H0, holomorphic sections, minus the rank of H1 of the line bundle. So if you have a line bundle of degree 0, the first thing you ask, well, so it's Euler characteristic of a line bundle of degree 0 is 0. So these ranks are the same. First thing you can ask is, does it have a holomorphic section or not? Well, if it has a holomorphic section, anytime you have a holomorphic section, well, anytime you have a meromorphic section of a line bundle, it will have zeros and poles. And the degree of the line bundle is the number of zeros minus the number of poles. Well, if this is a, uh, that's the degree. If this is a bundle of degree 0, then any section has to have as many zeros as poles. If this is a holomorphic section, by definition, it has no poles, and therefore it has no zeros. So then any element sigma, holomorphic section of the line bundle, has no zeros and no poles. 
course, and therefore it trivializes the line bundle holomorphically. Okay. So if L has a section, that implies L is isomorphic to the trivial bundle, which will follow algebraic geometry and write O of E rather than E cross C. Well, that's not the only line bundle of degree zero over the elliptic curve. And the way you find the others is as follows. So now suppose we have a line bundle without a section. So a non-trivial line bundle. Let's see if there are any, and let's try to, you no know, holomorphic section. Let's try to classify them. Okay. Well, we don't really have anything to start with because we have no sections. But there's a trick that, again, comes from the 19th century. Let's tensor this thing with a line bundle of degree 1. So this is the line bundle that's defined. It's a holomorphic line bundle, and it comes equipped with a section that vanishes, a holomorphic section, vanishing exactly one point, P0. Okay. In fact, we know how to make such line bundles. You take your curve. Here's P0. Take a local coordinate, so take an analytic neighborhood around P0 and take a local coordinate Z. Z equals 0 is P0. And consider the trivial bundle. Let me write it as E minus P0 cross C. I'm switching notation on you a little bit. This is the trivial holomorphic bundle outside of P0. Union the trivial bundle over U. But now I have to tell you how to identify, so on U minus P0, which is a puncture disk, uh, the two disks minus the origin, I want to tell you how to glue this thing to this thing holomorphically, and the section 1 here goes to the section Z here. So this section that looks out here in this trivialization, like it's just a constant section 1, when you get into this neighborhood, it's suddenly diving toward the origin. Okay? So these, the section 1 out here and Z here glue together to make a holomorphic section, obviously vanishing at the origin in this coordinate system. Okay? So that's this bundle. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the Euler characteristic of this? This bundle now has degree 1, and therefore it has a Euler characteristic 1, same formula degree is 1. Well, that means it has a holomorphic section because the rank of H0 is 1 bigger than the rank of H1. So that implies H0 of this bundle is not equal to 0. So there exists a holomorphic section. Sigma, well, the degree of this bundle is 1, so this holomorphic section has to vanish at exactly one point on the elliptic curve. So sigma vanishes at a point Q in the elliptic curve. And that turns out to be the only point that it vanished. I mean, the, OK. So then this bundle, L tensor, the line bundle, degree 1 with determinant with this is the 0, is isomorphic to this bundle. Because this, I can reverse this process. This section sigma can be used to identify this bundle with the one you construct this way. Okay. And that means then that L is OE of Q, tensor OE of P0 inverse. We often write that as OE of Q minus P0. Understand this in the language of divisors. 1 times this divisor minus 1 times this divisor. So we're looking at a bundle with a meromorphic section vanishing at Q and, meromorph and polar at P. Well, that turns out to determine an isomorphism between the, isom between the space of isomorphism classes of these L's, degree 0, and E. This, by the way, is called pick naught of E, not that it really matters for us. Okay. 
Well, you might say, but wait a minute, you had the trivial bundle. Of course, the trivial bundle is when Q happens to be P naught. And then this divisor, which looked like a sum of this point minus that, is suddenly trivial. Okay. Okay. So that's what line bundles of degree zero look like. Well, back in the 1950s, Atiyah classified all vector bundles over an elliptic curve using these sorts of ideas, and not much more. But that was before the days that it was understood that when you have a collection of objects in algebraic geometry and you're interested in studying them up to isomorphism, as you almost always are, that there's always a subclass that you should focus on. You shouldn't try to take all of them up to isomorphism because they won't make a reasonable space that you have any tools to study. You should concentrate on the best ones. They're called stable. And those will often, if not always, form moduli spaces very well in families and so on. And that's what we're going to do here. So we want to study not all vector bundles, but let's, let's say determinant trivial bundles. So let's look at SLNC bundles over E. Um, so these are bundles, these are vector, one way to think about these is vector bundles of degree n, holomorphic vector bundles of, sorry, degree of rank n over E, whose determinants are trivial. Now, I'm going to fudge whether or not I fix a trivialization or not. It's not an essential ingredient here. So that's what an SLN, a holomorphic SLN bundle over E will be. It's a holomorphic vector bundle, rank N, but trivial <coughs> determinant. And I want to study, well, to begin with, what I would call the stable ones. But in fact, there aren't any stable ones, so we end up studying the closure of the stable ones, called semi-stable. So let me tell you what this means. So the, what you want for this definition in general is that it's the subset of objects in, in this class for which the natural automorphism group action gives you a reasonable quotient. That's the conclusion you want. And the miracle of miracles, these, that condition is almost always determined by various numerical inequalities. And in this case, the numerical inequality is, it's very easy to state because we're working over a smooth curve, for every subbundle, so subholomorphic vector bundle, W in V, what's called the slope of W is less than or equal to the slope of V. So it's a numerical invariant, the slope is simply the degree of the bundle over the rank. So it's the average degree of the bundle. Okay. Now, V is an SLN bundle. Well, maybe I should say what the degree is. For a line bundle, it's pretty clear. When you have a higher degree vector bundle, there's still only one topological invariant, the first turn class. You can think of it as taking the determinant of this bundle, and that's a line bundle, and then it has a degree, and that's the degree of this bundle. Okay. So you take degree over rank. For us, the slope of V is 0 because I'm taking an SLN bundle. So for th uh, such a bundle is semi-stable if and only if every subbundle of it has degree less than or equal to 0. So for us, Semi-stable means every subbundle has degree less than or equal to zero. If I put strict inequality here, which would then mean strict inequality here, those are the stable points. But in this context, there aren't any stable points, except line bundles. <coughs> So that's what I want to study. So let me show you one. So we've already seen line bundles of the form 
line bundles of degree zero like that. So for each point in the elliptic curve, I can make a line bundle of degree zero, and every line bundle of degree zero looks like this. Okay. Well, if I wanted a higher rank vector bundle, I could certainly take a direct sum of these. So there's a vector bundle, holomorphic vector bundle of rank n over the curve. What's its determinant? Well, its determinant is simply the tensor product of these line bundles. And so when is this, what is this isomorphic to? So it's a line bundle of degree zero. It has to look like this for some q. It won't surprise you when I tell you that q is simply the sum in the group law of these q's. So this, in fact, is O of summation i equals 1 to n q i. That's q. So that's a one point in the elliptic curve. This is now not a divisor with n components. This is a divisor with one component. It's 1 times a point in the elliptic curve minus p naught. So, I need summation qi equals 0 in the elliptic curve in order to have an SLN bundle. Okay. Questions? Well, if the product will give you the summation in the sense of device, but there is some additional argument which. That's right. It's this three points add up to three points add up to zero are linearly equivalent. That's right. And you use it over and over and over again, and that's right. <coughs> yes, I didn't actually prove this for you, I just asserted it. Well, the, the, the point is that the, the group law is exactly the same as the tensor product of line bundles. <coughs> it might be more logical to, to make that minus in P0. P0 is, uh, is zero anyway, but it's. Uh, when you're adding them up as divisors, you'd actually get an in there, right? Yeah, but now I mean this as a single point in the elliptic curve. Right. I've switched from adding divisors to adding points. Okay. Well, what does this look like? Okay, I'm going to give you two descriptions. One, we simply have, let's start with the product of the elliptic curve in times. And then we have a map to the elliptic curve, which is add up the points. And we have the kernel. Okay. So that's simply n points in the elliptic curve adding up in the group law to zero. That's what this is. Um, it's convenient actually. Okay. Now, there's a symmetric group acting here, a symmetric group, symmetric group on n letters. I didn't make it explicit, but th the order of these line bundles is totally irrelevant. And therefore, the, the order of the points is totally irrelevant. So up to isomorphism, I only care about the unordered n-tuple. So I have to let the group sigma n act. It acts here by simply permuting the coordinates. It leaves the sum invariant, so it induces an action here. So from one point of view, all of these bundles, sums of line bundles, are uh, collection uh, E1 up to En in E, such that summation EI equals 0 in the elliptic curve, modulo the symmetric group. Well, what does that space look like? Well, there's another way to think about this space, which is where Claude was going, I think. There's a linear system in P0. In other words, take the line bundle with a section that vanishes to order in at P0 and everywhere else non-zero and holomorphic. That's a line bundle. It has a lot of sections. In fact, it has at least n sections by riemann rock and in fact it has exactly n sections. So H naught of this line bundle has rank n 
And each section then, each section of this bundle produces endpoints in the elliptic curve, the endpoints where the section vanishes up to permutation. And it's not too hard to see that, well, of course, if you multiply a section by an element in C star, you have the same vanishing. So if you take H naught minus the origin and divide by the standard C star action, this turns out to be another description of the same set. So this set, maybe it isn't so obvious from this description in terms of the elliptic curve, is in fact a projective space, ordinary projective space, of the cohomology of this particular line bundle. It's worth doing the case n equal 2 just to see that, because this is very classic. So the case n equals 2, we're talking about two points on the elliptic curve. Let me go back to my Weierstrass model. Okay, so y squared equals p of x. Now we have two points, q1 and q2 in E, and they add up to 0. Well, what does that mean in this picture? Well, remember the origin of the elliptic curve is out at infinity in this picture, and therefore vertical lines are the ones that go through the origin. So two points are negatives if they lie on the same vertical line, q1, q2. And you collapse these two onto the p1 in the x direction. You get a map from the elliptic curve to p1, a very famous map. It's ramified over four points in P1. One of them is infinity, and the other three are determined by the elliptic curve. So pairs of points in the elliptic curve up to, I mean, a point in the elliptic curve up to replacing it by its negative, or pairs of points that add up to zero up to the involution, is simply identified with this projective space, P1. And that's the two-sheeted cover of the elliptic curve over P1. That's the special case uh, when n equals 2. And your sections either vanish at q and minus q, distinct points, or at four different places you have a point of order 2, and the line bundle, the two line bundles are the same. Okay. Maybe it's worth saying that there's another way to think about this. There's a theorem, I guess we should attribute it to um, uh, Harder Nora Simon. Or maybe, no, Nora Simon Shashadri, I guess. I'm never sure who to associate this to. If you have a holomorphic, okay. Suppose we have a semi stable vector bundle. of degree 0 over a smooth curve, but here we're going to do an elliptic curve, E. Then it is, here's a new notion I have to introduce, S equivalent to a holomorphic bundle coming from a flat connection into SUN, the compact form of the group. So again, and the Narasim and Shashadri, okay? Arbitrary genus, the question is, was it known earlier in genus, uh, genus 1? Yeah, it probably was. Yeah. Yeah, this is a completely general theorem. And degrees, if you don't have degree zero, you can do special things. And anyway, it's vastly more general theorem. So see, suppose you have a, let's turn this around. Suppose I have a C infinity bundle with structure group SUN, and I have a flat connection on it. That flat connection will induce, is a holomorphic connection on the complexification of the bundle. So it produces a holomorphic bundle. It turns out you can reverse that up to a perturbation that I'm going to talk about for any semi-stable bundle of degree 0. So now what's S equivalence?
let me motivate it by talking about the corresponding notion for group elements. So let's just do SL2 for a moment. So every element in SL2 is conjugate to something like this as long as these are distinct. As long as the eigenvalues of a two-by-two two matrix are distinct, you can diagonalize it. So when they're not distinct, you have two different conjugacy classes. So when this is a, a root of two, a square root of uh, whatever it is, square root of one, right? Um, this and this are distinct conjugacy classes. Yet, we want to think of these as equivalent because there's, in fact, a one-parameter family, a holomorphic one-parameter family of group elements, whose, all of whose members are conjugate to this guy, except for the one over the origin, and it's this guy. And, of course, that one-parameter family is where t is your parameter. So you have a one-parameter family of elements in the group, holomorphic one-parameter family. Generically, ev almost everywhere, it's conjugate to one of these guys. And at the special value, it's conjugate to another. So again, if you're going to have some sort of quotient space of isomorphism types, you're going to have to identify these two, because this one is in the closure of that. Okay. Well, it's the same thing for bundles. Okay. If you have a family of bundles over some connected base across the elliptic curve, so think of this as a family of bundles over the elliptic curve parameterized by points in the base, by parameterized by points in B, if all of these are semi-stable, and if VB prime is isomorphic to VB double prime for all B prime, B double prime not equal to B naught, then VB naught and VB prime are S equivalent. Well, that generates an equivalence relation. Okay. Maybe I'll give you an example for two by two bundles of the complete analog of what I was talking about here. And this, in fact, will get us into where we're going. <coughs> Let's think about rank two vector bundles over the elliptic curve that are extensions of the trivial bundle by the trivial bundle. Okay. Well, there's a whole machinery on how you classify these. You write x, but these are vector bundles over smooth curves. So the extensions are given by elements in H1 of this bundle, dualized tensor this one. If I put a 1 here and a 2 here just to help you distinguish them looks like that. That's how it always works for vector bundles over smooth curves. Okay? Well, these are trivial, so we're talking about H1 of O. Well, degree of O is zero, so the Euler characteristic of O is zero, but O has a section, and therefore O has a non-trivial element in H1. So there is a non-trivial extension. In fact, there's a whole C's worth of them. So we now take our parameter space as this space of extensions cross E. And there's a vector bundle here, which is I mean, e two star. So just take family of extensions. And the extension class over any element here is the extension class of the restriction. So you have a family of vector bundles parameterized by this group of extensions. Over the origin, you have the trivial extension. That's just O plus O. Anywhere else, you have a non-trivial extension. All non-trivial extensions are isomorphic because you can scale the extension class. And they, in some sense, look like these guys. They're the analog of these guys, whereas the direct sum is the analog of this. So this vector bundle, non-trivial extension of O by O, is S equivalent to the split O plus O. But they're not isomorphic. Okay? And the 
uh, Narasim and Shashadri, well, in this case, what's it going to give you? Well, it gives you the direct sum of the stable factors. That's what it always gives you. There can't be any of this stuff when you're going into the compact group. Okay? So, in fact, if you apply the theorem to this vector bundle, the non-trivial extension of O by O, you will produce not a flat connection on that bundle, but rather a flat connection on O plus O, which is the trivial connection. Okay? You could do this for a, a different two torsion point, and then you'd have both factors would have a non-trivial connection of order two, but there'd still be no extension. Okay? So that's what S equivalence is. We have to allow these extensions to come and go. Well, now let's study these bundles from this point of view. So what do flat bundles look like? Well, a flat bundle is given by a homomorphism of the fundamental group of the elliptic curve into SUN, let's say. That's a compact group up to conjugation. So homomorphisms here up to an overall conjugation. Well, if I choose a basis for the fundamental group of E, I'm looking at two elements, X and Y in SUN, and XY is equivalent to GX, G inverse, GY, G inverse for any element in the group. Okay. So let's think about what those look like. Well, first of all, any element in a compact Lie group fix a maximal torus. Any element in a compact Lie group can be conjugated into the maximal torus. In fact, as long as the group is simply connected, any pair, commuting pair of elements, can simultaneously be conjugated into the maximal torus. So in fact, we might as well look at x and y in the maximal torus, let's call it h, up to the remaining conjugation is the vial group. So we're looking at the maximal torus cross itself modulo the diag diagonal action of the vial group. And notice from this description, the elliptic curve has completely disappeared. But of course, this isn't a holomorphic description. This is a topological description, though this topological description does produce holomorphic bundles over the elliptic curve. Well, there's a nice Pontryagin duality here. Um, to turn this picture more into one more like this. So the Pontryagin dual of the fundamental group of the elliptic curve, so that's homomorphisms of this thing into the circle. That's just the elliptic curve again. It uses the existence of the origin. And the Pontryagin dual of the maximal torus for, of, uh, of a torus, you write the torus as a vector space mod a lattice. This is simply the dual lattice, hom of this lattice into z. So these homomorphisms are the same thing as homomorphisms from the dual of the lattice that makes this torus into the elliptic curve. Well, that's the same thing as an element in the elliptic curve, tensor the lattice. So these things you can think of as the elliptic curve, tensor the lattice. Now we have to let the vial group act. Well, the vial group acts on the lattice, trivially on the elliptic curve, but then it acts on the tensor product. Well, OK, how does this fit with our previous description? What is this lattice? This is the lattice for SUN, so it sits inside z to the n, let's write it as z to the n, uh, sorry, yeah, sits inside z to the n as the kernel of the, th is the things that add up to zero. That's the lattice for SUN, or SLN, think of SLN, right? Okay, well, so what does this look like? We have E tensor lambda into E tensor Z to the N, that's just N copies of the elliptic curve. 
to one copy of the elliptic curve, and this again is the summation. So once again, we see this as simply endpoints in the elliptic curve adding up to zero. And then we divide by this bio group, which is a symmetric group. Okay. So we have three different descriptions of these holomorphic bundles of degree zero, these semi-stable ones, and they all give us a projective space. It's natural to think of this projective space as the projective space of what I would call split representatives. So in each S equivalence class, there is a bundle that's split, which in this case just means a sum of line bundles. There are other representatives sometimes, but there's and what this is doing, really, is naturally picking out the split representative. Okay. Now I want to give you two other constructions which are more holomorphic in nature and will generalize more easily, well, especially the second one, will generalize to other groups. So the first is a spectral cover construction, and the second is a more group theoretic called the parabolic. So the spectral cover, let's again go start with SL2. And we have our parameter space of these bundles, which is P1. And then we have the elliptic curve on which the bundles exist. So this is the parameter space of all the split SL2 bundles of degree 0. So this is, okay. And this is the elliptic curve. Well, we have the natural product of the elliptic curve with itself mapping down to P1 across the elliptic curve. This is the double cover map here, the ramified double cover here, across the identity here. Okay. This is called, for reasons you'll see in a minute, the spectral cover. And I'm going to take the diagonal inside E cross E, that's a divisor, and I want to take E cross P0 inside E cross E. P0 is the origin of the elliptic curve of the group. And I want to consider the line bundle on the total space, E cross E, which is the difference of these two divisors. So this is a line bundle with a meromorphic section vanishing to first order along the diagonal and polar on this vertical thing. Okay, if you think of the first factor as vertical, maybe it's horizontal. In fact, I was talking to Jason earlier, and I had the P naught on the wrong factor, but I think you've got it right now. So that's a line bundle up here. So this is some line bundle over E cross E. Okay. Let's call this map F. Let's push it forward. This is an interesting thing in algebraic geometry. It takes a while to get used to, but it's a beautiful construction, and it's used all over the place. So we push it forward, and we get something over the quotient space. How are we supposed to think of that something? Well, let's think of it generically first. Away from the, the, double, the ramification in P1. So here's the P1 cross E, and here's a good generic point in P1. Okay. Above this point, we have two copies of E. Q and minus Q cross E. Right. So we have upstairs, we have two copies of E projecting onto this copy of E. And our line bundle, well, what is it on these two copies of E? Well, here the line bundle is L of minus Q minus P naught, and here it's L of Q. Maybe I should call this Q and Q prime, but we understand that Q plus Q prime is zero. Right. So up above this copy of E, I have two copies of E and a line bundle over each copy. What happens when I push forward? I simply get the sum of those two line bundles. Okay. So over here, I get L of Q minus P naught plus L of Q prime minus P naught. Q and Q prime are the two pre-images pre of this point here. All well and good. So 
generically away from the four bad points in P1, the ramification points, I simply see the sum of the two line bundles that are parameterized by that point. So that's the semi-stable bundle associated with that point, and it's the only representative. When these roots are distinct, there is only the split representative. There's no upper triangular matrices to play with. And of course, as you move around, sort of interesting things happen. Okay, now what happens at the ramification points? Well, so let's think about the ramification point over the origin, okay, just for a moment. Well, upstairs, I only have one point, so this two copies of E and so on doesn't work anymore. What I really have, sorry for the lingo, is I have spec of C of Z mod Z squared cross E, mapping to X cross E. I don't really just have one copy of E. What's happened is these two copies of E have come together, and what I see above it is some E with some fuzz in the normal direction, which is a rank two thingamabob. That's spec of this, right? They've come together. All right, well, this is naturally filtered by the maximal ideal sits inside, and the quotient is C. So it's a rank two vector, I mean, it's a two-dimensional vector space generated by one and Z. And so you have the z multiples of Z sitting in as a subring, and the quotient is the constants. Well, so that tells you that whatever this bundle is down here, it's going to have an extension of O by O, the trivial bundle by the trivial bundle. And working out the extension class is fun, but it's non-trivial. Okay? And that happens at the four two torsion points. You get, a non, you get always an extension of the order two line bundle by, the, by itself, but the extension class is always non-trivial. So this is called the spectral cover, and it produces semi, these bundles are all semi-stable, but it doesn't produce the split representatives. When it can, it produces the non-split representative. And for SL2, there are only two possibilities. It's either split or non-split. Okay. So it's a different, it's an isomorphic projective space, because whether or not the bundle is split or not, it's S equivalent to a split bundle. So this projective space is isomorphic to that one over there, canonically. But the set of bundles that it's parameterizing are not isomorphic. They're just S equivalent. So here we're getting, um, well, we're getting these more interesting non-trivial extensions. So what happens for SLN or, is very similar. We take uh, what I just had before, endpoints uh, in the elliptic curve adding up to zero. And we divide by the symmetric group on the first n minus one letters. In other words, I take a point sigma in NP naught and one of the Q's in the support of sigma equals zero. So I have a collection of unordered collection of endpoints that add up to zero, and I not only have that collection, I've also associated one of them. Okay, so I've picked out one. Here, it was sort of hard to see that you'd picked out one because when you pick out one, you've got them both. But over here, if I pick out one, I'm left with n minus one that the lower symmetric group can act on. Okay, and call that T. T, of course, maps to this projective space, which is divided out by the full symmetric action. And this is an interesting map, but let me not go into that. Let's cross with E. Now, in here, there's a very similar divisor to the one we talked about there. Namely, there's a map from T to E, which sends the n-tuple to the one distinguished point, the only one you've picked out. Okay, and therefore T cross E maps to E cross E, and I can pull back the diagonal and call that diagonal naught, the divisor in here. It's simply the graph of the map from T to E, which associates to an n-tuple mod the symmet <coughs> symmetric action, the last point. <coughs> and now the line bundle I'm interested in over T cross E <coughs> is uh, 
the line bundle with a section zero along this divisor and polar on T cross P naught. Okay? The complete analog of what I just did before. Okay? Now this is a now the fibers here are uh, n to one, not two to one, because they're n points I could have picked out. So generically they'll be distinct and I'll have n of them. So this is an n to one map. Well that's generically, it's really n points mapping to one. Then there's ramification, but this technically is the right kind of map. It's called flat. Where these, when the points come together you get higher order information. So it, you always, the fiber in some algebra geometric sense is always uh, the equivalent of n points. Though they may be counted with multiplicities. So if you push this bundle down, this line bundle down, you'll get a vector bundle of rank n over um, the base p and minus 1 cross e. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be the family of semi-stable bundles parameterized by this thing, but now we're picking the regular representative instead of the split representative, the maximally extended representative. Okay. So the max, what's the maximally extended representative? Well, think of the S equivalence class and break the points up or the line bundles up into groups of isomorphic ones. So you'll have some L1, L1, L1 that occurs some number of times, R1, and then you'll have L2, L2, R2, and so on. It's sort of generically what will happen is well, generically, they'll be distinct. Next most generic, two of them will be isomorphic, and all the others will be distinct, and so on. But you can have any partition of n. What you do here is, well, let's look at the extensions of a line bundle by itself. Well, again, this is just like the extensions of O by O, because it's the dual of this tensor that. So there's one non-trivial. There's a one-dimensional space. There's one non-trivial one. You take that one. And now if you look at V2 and try to extend it by, again, this same line bundle, again, a simple computation shows there's a unique extension, and you just keep going. So you always choose the non-trivial extension. So you extend these all. So this is the analog of you know, taking the maximal Jordan uh, nilpotent element. Okay? And you do that for each one of these types. Okay? That's the maximally non-split bundle, and that's what this construction produces. But it does produce the right family. I mean, this, of course, is S equivalent to the bundle where it's just the direct sum of all these pieces, but you've replaced these non-trivial extensions, you've deformed them down to the, to the split thing when you try to put in a flat connection. So that's the spectral cover construction. <clears throat> so you the modulus spectral bundles together with the universal bundles. Right, there is a bundle over this, right? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, when you do it in families, there's a little bit of choice, but let's, yes. Yes, this varies holomorphically, that's the point. There is a universal bundle over this thing. Those flat ones do not vary holomorphically. So when you, even in the P1 case, when you out over the non-trivial points, when you put the sum of line bundles and you want to try to extend over these points of order two, the only holomorphic extension is the one we've written down. If you tried the sum, you can't do that holomorphically. Well, the, the only invariant of a only invariance of a bundle over a curve topological. Oh, yeah, you can. We computed all those during classes. I don't remember them off the top of my head. Yeah, you know explicitly what those during classes are. Um, okay, this turns out the construction I want to show you now turns out to be the one that generalizes best to other groups. A spectral curve construction. Maybe I should just say. This works well as long as you have a good 
um, linear representation of the group. Now, what do I mean by good? The technical term is minuscule. All the weights of the representation are conjugate. So for SLN, we have a minuscule representation. Every group except E8, every simple group except E8, has a minuscule representation. E8 does not. Ed used to say, well, take a group, any group, E8. You know, <laughs> this is the theory of groups, which is really the theory of E8. If you can do it for E8, it's done. <clears throat> you know, for E6, for example, you take the famous 27, the 27-dimensional representation of E6, and you do a spectral cover. Anyway, parabolic construction works uh, completely generally. And let's, let's think about SLN, and let's uh, divide k and n minus k. So choose an integer k between 1 and n minus 1. And let's look for a bundle of degree 1 and rank k. This is supposed to be now a stable bundle. Its determinant, in fact, not only is it degree 1, its determinant is fixed at the base point, and it's rank k. Well, it turns out there's one, and it's unique up to isomorphism. I won't try to prove that right now, but I'll just tell you how you build it. For k equals 1, we know how to build it. We have a line bundle, and its determinant is supposed to be this. Well, that means the bundle is this. OK, now if I want to build a rank 2 bundle of determinant 1, I'm going to extend this rank 1 bundle by the trivial bundle. And it turns out that the extensions is one-dimensional, and that fills the next one. And you just keep putting O's on the end, this way, right, on the beginning. OK, and this is a stable bundle. It can be stable now because its slope is 1 over k. So anyway, degree 0 things don't de destabilize it. All right. And now we look for bundles of the following form. Wk vector bundle Wn minus k minus 1, which is just the dual to the bundle I've been talking about here, but with rank n minus k. Okay. So you look for extensions like this. Well, of course, the split extension is not, well, the extension, any extension like this is rank n and degree 0. The split extension is not semi-stable because it has this sub-bundle in it, which is degree 1. Okay? But it's not obvious that any non-trivial extension has a destabilizing bundle. And in fact, prove quite easily that every non-trivial extension is semi-stable. So all non-trivial extensions are semi-stable. It's a very simple argument. If something destabilized, it would have negative degree. I'm sorry, it would have positive degree. So you map it into here. But it would destabilize this unless this image was either 0 or the whole thing. Well, it couldn't be 0 because then you'd have a positive degree thing mapping into a negative degree thing. That's not possible. So the image has to be the whole thing. The kernel has to be degree 0, and it would destabilize this bundle unless it was nothing. And therefore, it has to be W1 splitting the extension. OK, quick proof. All right. So in this cohomology group, the extension group, H1 of WK star tensor uh, WN minus K minus 1, the rank of this turns out to be N. And therefore, we can take this extension space, the first cohomology, minus the origin up to the natural C star action here, and that's a projective space. So another projective space occurs. It's a projective space of semi-stable bundles, and it's not too hard to show that this is another description of the moduli space. So every semi-stable bundle appears. It appears uniquely up to S equivalents in this family. And furthermore, what bundles are we getting? Are we getting the split ones? Are we getting these regular ones? Are we getting something in between? The answer is we're getting the regular ones. And this is a holomorphically varying construction. So this construction produces the same bundles, universal bundle over the projective space, up to twisting with a line bundle on the projective factor um, that the spectral cover produced.
Sorry? Uh, what's the role of strings? Irrelevant. This bundle actually twists a little bit as you change k by a line bundle and project your space, that's all. So let me just finish by saying, well, two things. First of all, there's something called the Atiyah bot ordering on these unstable type bundles. And what I've done here is picked out a maximal element in that ordering. And that means that everything that flows out of this has to be stable. There are, as he just pointed out, here I could choose any integer k and do this construction. For every other Lie group, there's a unique maximal element in the Atiyah bot ordering. So this goes with parabolic subgroups of the Lie group. Maximal parabolics are given by taking one node out of the Dinkin diagram, and the node guess which one? It's the trivalent node in the simply laced case. It's the node on the end of the double bond, the long one in the uh, non-simply laced case. So you know which parabolic you're using. There's a unique bundle over that parabolic. That parabolic is a, 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 it's a collection of GLNs with common determinant. You take exactly the same bundle over those GLNs, and you do extensions with respect to unipotent cohomology in the group. That unipotent cohomology has a C star action on it. It's no longer a projective space, necessarily. It has weights having to do with the integers on the Dinkin diagram. And those are the weights of the C star action. So you produce a weighted projective space of bundles this way. And that weighted projective space turns out to be isomorphic to this other picture. The fact that the other picture always gave a weighted projective space was already known as Lewinka's theorem. He studied E tensor lambda mod the vowel group in terms of, oh, I don't know, some kind of, I don't know how he did it. Theta, theta functions, yeah. But I don't understand that. It proved it was a weighted projective space. This actually gives a direct holomorphic description of that weighted projective space. And the computations of the degrees of the cohomology are just things about root systems. So it's all inside the Dinkin diagram in the root system. And then there's a little, you have to worry, how do you prove that projective space really maps isomorphically onto the one you have? Well, you know it's a finite to one map. That's a general fact about weighted projective spaces. Then you need to show it's degree zero, and that's some volume computation. And then once it's, I'm sorry, degree one. And once it's degree one, in fact, it has to be an isomorphism. Again, a fact about weighted projective spaces. All right, well, I was going to tell you all about parabolic subgroups and G and so on and so forth. I clearly didn't get there. But this is the beginnings of this theory. What happens over singular curves is very interesting. What happens in families of curves? Ed was interested because of the relationship of uh, the duality between heterotic string theory and F theory, which was big in those days. In the heterotic string, you have a family, you have a probably a Calabi Yau, it's fibered by elliptic curves, and then over it you have either an E8 cross E8 or a D16 bundle, depending on which variant you're doing. And you want to compare that with Calabi Yau's, which are fibered by elliptically fibered K3s. So the easiest thing to do is to take an elliptic curve and an E8 cross E8 bundle or a D16 bundle and compare that to moduli of K3. In fact, they're elliptically fibered K3s with section. And that all works out sort of at the level of the Lewinga point, you know, the moduli spaces are isomorphic. We did a little bit with some families of elliptic surfaces versus Calabi out three folds, but we didn't really completely understand that picture, and we didn't get up to the one that would be physically interesting, which is elliptically fibered three folds and four folds fibered by elliptically fibered K3s. But that's where this was coming from. We couldn't really say much about that, but there are a lot of interesting questions left. All right. I'll stop there. What, 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 what should I get? Should I get some modular space of maps into this? this way? Well, that's where you would start. Yeah. I mean, one issue you always have to worry about is the difference between stability on the surface, and that implies generic stability on the elliptic curve, at least if you take the right polarization. The reverse doesn't always work, and you do have to worry about what happens on these exceptional fibers. But yeah, that was how Bob and I were studying these things in our space. Or issue two. Yeah.
your uh, stable bundles can also be seen through a spectral curve. Uh, yeah, that so was. I mean, was this T cross E? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, if you take a, an unramified covering of the elliptic uh, K-fold covering, so the line bundle upstairs, you push it in, and then you get this thing. So take an unramified, so just take an ordinary covering, K-fold yeah. covering. Yeah. All right. So, you say, so it was torn up, I guess. So, so uh, take the line bundle upstairs, and take push your edge, and you get So a degree zero line bundle. Uh, yeah, I guess so. But, so I would, I mean, that seems like so. Let's write that is no, no, maybe not degree zero. But this I can't remember the degree, but it's it's a basically just a push line, isn't it? Right? Well, you it's certainly would get a vector thing. bundle. You get a vector bundle, but you get right same degree. same reason. In fact, but it's a sum of line bundles, right? No, it's the it's the uh, it's these. So Sorry, it's it's an unramified. You take an unramified cover, yeah. isogeny, right? Of the uh, could be the same, same with the curve itself. Yeah. You take a line bundle upstairs, I can't remember what degree, and then you take this direct image. But I think if I have it, seems to me if I have an unramified cover, I take a line bundle upstairs, I mean, yeah. this is a, this is a normal much. cover, right? Then I would just get the sum of the line bundle plus all its translates, because there's no ramification to. Some incompatibility with the picture that I have and what you're describing. I know. But I mean, if I have a line bundle upstairs and I have a cyclic group action, let's say. Well, finite cyclic group action. Yeah. A finite, group action. finite group action. Free action. Then I could just. Oh, I see. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. Don't break it up into pieces. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I see what you're doing. All right. So you say I get stable bundles when I get all the stable bundles when I do that? Yeah, it's kind of an easier construction than FTA's original one, which is this mm -hmm. uh, uh, repeated extension. Whether it's easier to prove stability, I'm not sure. Uh, FTA never worried about stability, right? That probably no, didn't even exist in Exactly. <laughs> this was the paper where he just gave things in terms of. Uh, of uh, automorphisms, you just went up to, up to uh, C minus the origin, and um, no, it was basically through. Well, yeah, you have these <laughs> probably the sort of first ten minutes of my talk, and then done for vector bundles and rank in, and, yeah, yeah. and where you can allow different degrees, and you know, you have destabilizing things, it becomes much more complicated. Was it before or after the growth in theory for the bundles in the sphere? It must or have been after. He was probably trying to generalize growth in theory. It was 1955, something Stuff like that. Yeah. When was growth in the theory? Okay. I mean, too bad he said he left. We could ask him, right? <laughs> yeah, but I think growth in the theorem was known. I think it was known. Yeah. You know when growth in the theorem was proved? I think it was the early 50s. Yeah, okay. By Birkhoff. Birkhoff proved? Yeah. It's Birkhoff, Gretchen. Birkhoff. You don't know history than I do. All right. <laughs>